Well, the power's not out everywhere, amen? amen. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. We have some units that will probably need to be replacing some bulbs in, so we just, if you want to watch the sermon notes, they'll be over here on your right and my left. So at least we got one working, so that's a praise the Lord. We'll check these others out, and I'll go ahead and assign a task as we begin. Brother Frank, would you have some men set the scaffolding up in here before you leave today? If you could do that for me, I'd appreciate that. We'll get those checked out and see what's going on there. Isn't God good? I'm starting a series of messages uh, on the miracles of Jesus. I kind of dabbled with this uh, probably 10 years ago and, and preached on a lot of the miracles of Jesus and did it on a Wednesday night, just kind of getting into it. But boy, I, last month I've been looking this over again and praying about it and seeing what's there. And there's so much more. In fact, the miracle messages that you, if you heard those on a Wednesday night, they're probably completely different than even what you heard because there's just so much there. In fact, even looking at this first one today, as we start uh, this series of messages, uh, we're really not starting with number one miracle of Jesus. I, I don't know if it's Jesus. I guess it would be. The virgin birth is obviously a miracle of the New Testament. So we're not looking at all the miracles of the New Testament, specifically those that are attributed to the Lord Jesus Christ and his ministry. And obviously we want to look at the number one that was started his ministry, having to do with the, the miracle of the water being turned to wine in, in John chapter 2. A lesson in obedience. And this is an important miracle, as they all are. Please understand, they're, they're not just there as kind of little stories that kind of highlight that Jesus had miraculous power like he's Superman or something. Uh, in fact, the word in the, in the Gospel of John for miracles in the English Bible is always translated sign. It's the first sign that he did. But uh, the, the word in the Greek language used for miracles is really a word that that's the actual translation. It's a sign. So even though it was a supernatural thing and it was a, a genuine occurring event, uh, that it really happened, it's a miraculous thing, but it's, it's, understand that every miracle was a sign. And as we go through them at different times in the message series that we look at, we'll point out some specific things about the context in which the miracle was done. Because there are some miracles, signs, that are specific to the context of what was happening in the moment, a message that Jesus was uh, speaking before and after perhaps or someone he was dealing with before and after so all these are very significant signs and as a sign they all point to one thing the the deity or the messiahship that Jesus Christ is the Christ that he is the Lord of glory that he is God in the flesh so it's really important when we look at these things that we we get that clear message from him that Jesus is God there's a lot of people that still have problems with that by the way but we believe that Jesus Christ not only the Son of God, that he is God in the flesh, all right? So uh, Jesus said, if any man's seen me, he's seen the Father. So we see there's this, there's this declaration of his deity. But in the context of even that, there's more, uh, I, I would say, more the, 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 the practical application of the message and uh, what the Lord is saying to us. It was, he was making a statement then about his deity, but he's also, as I said, in the context of different miracles, he was making specific statements. But there is something he wants to say to each and every one of us through these, these, these things. Many times when we read scripture and we talk about and teach scripture, we, we always emphasize context. What is the Lord saying to those people at that time? But in, that, in the context, there's always these glorious principles from the word of God that God wants us to learn and to, he teaches us and we should understand. In looking at this first, the, the water to wine miracle, uh, I want us to start in John chapter 2 as it says, verses 1 through 11. I'll have these on, on the one screen at least. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited. It's always nice to invite Jesus. Amen? And his disciples to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour's not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says unto you, you know, whatever his statement is to you, that's what... Let me get my buttons pushed here. Whatever he says to you, that's what you do. You do it. Now there were uh, six stone water pots that were set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. So up to 180 gallons of water. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw out some, some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And that when the head waiter saw that, 
Let me get it right there. And when the head waiter uh, had, had seen what had, had become water become wine and didn't know where it came from, the servants who had drawn the water knew, and the head waiter called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk freely, then that which is poor, you've kept the good wine until now. Well, this is the beginning of his signs Jesus did in Can of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now, obviously, when that never-ending conversation and dialogue comes up about wine and Christians and drinking. Uh, I have had a lot of people always kind of run to this particular story in the Bible where Jesus turned the water into wine. Please understand this morning this passage is not an argument you know, for wine drinking and that people want to make out of it, you know, that, uh, well, that wine, that wine, was it alcohol wine or was it not alcohol wine or was there no alcohol in it? Uh, because uh, I wasn't there and neither were you. But let me say this, just from what we do know historically and what we do know about the culture and the time that they were in, uh, all grape juice, after some period of time of storage, per, begins a fermentation process. Now, they did not have this distillation and fermentation speeding up processes and hermetically sealing things like, like we have today. And so that the alcohol content in wine is much, much, much less than what it was then. And the custom was, and it doesn't take any history science genius to figure this out, especially among the Hebrews, the custom was that when any alcohol began to be, the hint of alcohol began to be in there that was obvious, then they'd begin to dilute the, the wine down, sometimes uh, one part wine, two parts water, sometimes one part wine, three parts water. But that was the, the standard of, of uh, what was going on. But let me also say in the context of that, we're at a what? A wedding. And remember that a wedding in, in, in the Hebrew culture was not just an event where two people got married. It was a religious event. I mean, it was a, it was a sacred event. We know in scriptures, the Bible teaches us that, that uh, marriage is a sacred union between a man and a woman. And so we're at this event, and obviously uh, this is a religious ceremony and a religious service. Uh, if you've never heard Pastor Tim's study on the, the Jewish wedding, that's, that's a treat. You ought to get, get it. I think we may even have it on tape around here. Or we'll have him teach it again soon because it's just a great, great study. But out of that, one of the first things you see is that, you know, marriage is ordained. The institution is ordained by God, and it is a sacred institution. So it's highly unlikely that this Jewish wedding in this poor community, that this is going to become a drunken party. Come on. It's a seven-day event. And in this seven-day event, you know, that, that takes place, uh, there's, uh, there's not going to be this, this kind of thing happening. In fact, in that day, wine, grape juice, where it's begun the process of fermentation or whatever, it's, 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 it's not something that would be used to get, uh, to, to all, let's all get drunk every day at every meal. And it's, it's, no, it was just a natural course of time and a natural process through, through the dilution process that people drank wine. Uh, now, we know that if you also study, it doesn't take long, and you study the scriptures that people would also, uh, by the Bible talks about in Proverbs, uh, be at wine for a long time. The Bible talks about drunkenness and intoxication, and all through scripture, God uh, condemns and does not condone getting drunk. All right? So if there's any argument there, please understand that, that, that there's no place in scripture. But the wine was a staple of diet in that day. But drunkenness was always condemned. And if you think that drunkenness is connected with this and with wine and with partying, then you've got the wrong party and you're at the wrong address. All right. In fact, if you want to know how to throw a party, just invite Jesus and you'll get the instructions. Amen. 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 But understand. And again, there's just so much we could take from this, but that's not what I want to get to today. I do want to say this, though, as we get into this, that this first miracle of Jesus that was done at a wedding, and it was done here in Cana at this particular wedding, that's where he began his basic earthly ministry. We see it kind of take off and rocket from here. But please understand that just as it was at a wedding that he began his ministry, it will be at a wedding where he finishes, at least to the church, that earthly ministry to the bride of Christ, where the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, or the, the bride of Christ, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will be presented to him. It'll be a glorious wedding time. So that is even another message, a prophetic message. There's also a message of grace over judgment here. The first miracle that Moses did in his set of miracles before Pharaoh, one of those first miracles where, was, where he turned the water into, anybody remember? Into blood, which spoke of judgment. 
Isn't it interesting that Jesus comes in grace and mercy and turns the water not into judgment, not into a blood, but, all, but he turns it here into wine. That which would satisfy, that which would, would be a, for a celebration of a joyous occasion like a marriage. But again, there's, it just keeps going and going. You have the context of this, the river turned to blood and judgment. Understand the Bible says that, you know, there's no salvation from our sins, but by the shedding of blood. So we understand here's Jesus that it comes on the scene in grace and beauty and glory who will ultimately shed his blood and take upon our judgment upon himself so that you and I might enjoy the fullness and the joy and the blessing of life. There were six water pots that were here, six clay pots that were used. Each would hold 20 to 30 gallons, the scripture says. That's a lot of water, it's close to 180 gallons that now are gonna be used for something else. In fact, these were used, as it says in verse 10, I believe it is, for the purification of the Jews. These water pots were would be filled with water and used during this, this, this whole process because the first thing, that there were ceremonial washings that you had to go through. As a good Hebrew, there would be strict laws that you would follow for washing your hands, washing your hands before meals, washing your hand between courses and meals at some times, and obviously after the meal. This purification water would come from these jars. And in fact, it would, not just the purification of, uh, of washing our hands, it extended into the washing of the utensils as well. I mean, there'd be the washing of hands, the washing of cups and vessels that would take place. Uh, in fact, remember the Pharisees are condemning J Jesus' disciples because they didn't wash their hands in the ceremonial process that others were. But you add to that, you know, we didn't have sidewalks and paved roads back then. Everybody wore sandals or barefoot. And so that everybody's feet got continually dirty, so there had to be the washing of feet, and this would be for that. If this is a large wedding, I mean, you got a lot of people, a lot of purification ceremonies, a lot of washing of feet, so the large amount of water would be required. So these vessels are there for these kind of things. In fact, the wedding often lasts, we said, seven days. The feast followed the groom, taking of his bride to his home or his father's house before the consummation of the marriage. And Mary, in this process of being there at this wedding, Jesus is there with some of the disciples. She turns to him when she sees the problem and she wants to see the problem solved, like most good women. Amen. She turns to Jesus. We've run out of wine. Now, why is she telling him? Well, unless she's a good Jewish mother to start with. My mother's a good mother. She usually, if there's a problem solved, she gives me a call. She thinks I'm the problem solver, I guess. But, you know, she turns and she wants, she wants to resolve the problem. Whether Maybe she's telling Jesus, don't drink anything because there's not enough. Did your mother ever tell you that? Don't eat all too much because there's not enough for everybody. So whatever it is, or maybe she's as invoking him to do something miraculous. And if that's, if that's the point where Jesus says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Now, woman is that word in the Hebrew language for ish. It's a very common term for, for ma'am, for woman. And so it, this is not a disrespectful thing if that's the way you're, you're reading it. In fact, the words in the Greek language, that little phrase of what have I to do with you, was a very co common term in the day. You know, uh, what do you need from me? What have I to do with you? It could mean that. Or it could be like the, the demons. They use this terminology with Jesus when they saw him. What are we to do with you, son of the most high God? So this, I do not believe in any regard this is a, uh, some kind of disrespectful statement to his mother, but I do believe that he probably is a statement saying, Mom, uh, if this is the Father's will, I'll do something. But it hasn't got anything to do between you and me. It has everything to do with me and the Father. Remember what Jesus said later in John, I only do those things my Father has told me. So whether she's trying to press him into something, Jesus is not going to be pressed in anything. He's going to do what God tells him. And we know that obviously the father must have spoke to him because later in John he says, I only do those things which my father reveals to me. The father must have spoke to him and given him the, the release or the instruction to do with it. The, the phrase of my time is not yet come it is used a lot of different times in scripture uh, in, in, or some similar words. In fact, just in John alone, it occurs about five times. And later, the fact that his time had come is mentioned three times in John where he talks about how that his time had come and it was time for him to do areas of, 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 and respond to the, fa the Father's ministry for him. But Mary's response is kind of just to leave that. She understands this point. It's between the Father and the Son. And she, just re she doesn't press him. She just turns to the servant with kind of like, by the way, all right? If he tells you to something, whatever he tells you to do something, do it. 
So the room is made there that if Jesus is going to move, she's, she's not going to press the issue. She's going to allow the Lord to respond. And she's obviously surrendering to his leadership and his lordship because not only is, is she mom, she's also a follower at this point in her time in life where she becomes a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have the Jesus calls for the purification pots of water to be filled. And then the servants are going to come and lay out of this water that which becomes wine. Now the words here, they're, they're, they're probably the most powerful words, and, and the key to all the miracles of the Lord Jesus is, is that, that she says here, she gives this word, that whatever Jesus tells you to do, that's what you do. Now that becomes pretty much the uh, bottom line or the key perhaps that we need to understand that unlocks the door for all these miracles and really for everything that the Lord is going to do in your life. If you can learn this simple principle that she gives to these servants, apply it to your life, it'll transform your life. In fact, you know, this is, this is a passage that I was familiar with even as a child being raised by a godly mother. She'd said this to me on more than one occasion. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, son, you do that. She made it very clear. She was at our early service at the Magnolia campus this morning. She, just, she said, I'm just glad you remembered. <laughs> Whatever he says to do. In fact, she, you know, for those of you who know my mom, she writes these little encouraging cards to a lot of different people, and I've gotten them all in my life. And one of those little cards says just that. Whatever he says to you, do it. Great words of advice. Great words of instruction. Powerful words if we'll respond to them and do it. Whatever the Lord's telling us to do. So I want to look at that a little closer today. And I want you, first of all, as we look at this, to, to observe these, these, these things that, were, that are featured in, in what she's telling and what kind of advice that she's giving. The first thing she talks about, whatever he says to do, you do it. That has to do with obedience in the context of our obedience should be entire. And that word whatever is a pretty big term, isn't it? Whatever the Lord tells you to do, <coughs> do it. Whatever God's saying to you. And I would even ask you this morning, if you have any kind of spiritual mind about you at all, any kind of spiritual inclination today, that you would just kind of stop right where you are mentally in, in your mind and say, Lord, what is that one thing you're telling me to do? What is it? Because whatever it is, you know, whatever it is, it encompasses a lot of territory. Whatever it is, do it. At our early service in the Magnolia campus, there was a gentleman who pulled in the parking lot on his way to visit his wife in the hospital. Not a member, never been to the church before, just felt, just, I felt just impelled to turn in here. And he came in and we spent some time talking with him, took him in the office, and uh, just a lot of chaos was going on in his life, physical problems in his life, in his wife's life. She's <clears throat> been con confined into a, to a nurse's, nursing care facility. All kinds of issues, he lost his home, job's gone, just one thing, it's just a world of chaos and a whirlwind that he is going through. And of course, in those situations of our life, we always start asking questions. God, where are you this? You know, where, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? All those kind of issues. Sometimes we don't wait for answers. Most of the time we don't. We just kind of set on our own path, try to resolve the problem ourselves. And we don't really hear what God's saying to us. And the more I talked to him, this kind of seemed to be the direction he was going. And uh, my words were pretty much these same words. What is it God wants you to do here in this situation in your life? You know, you've named all these issues and all these problems that you're going through today. But what do you think God's trying to tell you in the middle of it? He hasn't abandoned you. You may feel like he has at times. I mean, there's been times I've felt that way. You, you, but you, we, God doesn't allow these kind of things to go on in our life without really trying to do something in us and say something to us and transform us and work in our lives. Like water being turned to wine, the water of our lives being turned into something special and unique. What is it? And if you can identify that, if you can slow down long enough to hear what God's saying to you, then there's your key to moving forward at this point. But can you come to the place to say, I, I'll be still enough, I'll be quiet enough, or I'll get in the Word enough to really let the Lord speak to me? Because if I'm going to see an intervention on any kind of supernatural level or God get involved in the situation, I need to be, be obedient to the Lord, but I, I, I need it for it to be the, the obedience he expects. You, you remember the story of, of uh, King Saul who was given instructions to go, to go slaughter the, the, the enemy and just completely destroy them and their king and their livestock, everything. leave nothing. And he went and he did as, the, as the, the prophet had given instruction from the Lord, but he didn't do it completely. You know, he held out parts. And, and the, the 
Samuel's word to Saul was something like this. Has the Lord d- d- delight in, in, uh, in, in sacrifice and offering? No. He delights in obedience. The Lord delights in us doing what he's told us to do. But how often is God begins to direct us in something, we would rather do something else. God's telling me to get right in some regard in my life. Oh, well, I, I'll go to church. Well, that's noble. Go to church. You ought to go to church. But what's God telling you to do besides that? Well, I need to read my Bible. Well, okay, that's good. Let's start reading your Bible. And I know a lot of folks because it's, na- it's natural human pride that if we discover that we're failing in some regard, uh, we just double our efforts. <laughs> but it's noble for you to double your efforts, but it doesn't come by works. The grace of God does not. It comes by surrendering, by yieldingness to the Lord. And if we would surrender enough to say, Lord, what is that area of my life? And get that right with God. It's amazing what God can do in our life. Focus in on what needs to be focused in on. Quit dealing with all these peripheral things in your life and get down to the real issues of your life. Whatever he says to do, that's what you do. Our obedience is to be focused on that deal, whatever that is, and it should be entire. And that's what we focus on. Then the second thing about this is our obedience is to be exclusive. So what are we to do? We're to do whatsoever. But whatsoever what? Whatever he says to the exclusion of everybody else. If, the, if counsel that I get from friends and even pastors and fellow saints of God and backslidden relatives or whoever it might come from, if it is different from Jesus's, ignore it. Now, the Bible tells us there's safety in the multitude of counselors. Now, it's good to get good counsel and good advice, all right? The Bible says, you know, by wise counsel, wage war. If you've got to fight to fight, man, do it with good counsel. Get, get clarity. Talk to people who've walked there, been there, done that, all right? And, uh, and then follow the good counsel if it lines up with the Lord's counsel. It, it's, uh, I don't know, a lot of times it's easier for us to run off to our favorite spiritual guru. You know, somebody can give us that word. Give me a word. I need a word. And I have people in my office like this, you know, and, and, and you find out that in seeking a word, it's good to get counsel. But what are you doing yourself between you and God to get that word? Where is your time with God? Where's the, where does the word of God, the Bible, where does it fit into your life? Where does it fit into your schedule? If you're the kind of person who always wants to get a word from God without going to the word of God, you're going to live a life of constant mistakes. Because a lot of people tell you a lot of stuff that sounds good, but it's not whatever he's telling you to do. That obedience to the Lord, there has this element of exclusivity to it, which means that's what the Lord wants to do. That's what I do. And if anybody else's instructions differ from that, then it, 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 it goes out the window and I'm going to embrace what the Lord wants me to do. But our obedience, not only that, is to be entire exclusive, but it's to be exact. Whatever he says to you, do it. And by the way, a long time before Nike ever marketed, just do it, Jesus had marketed it, all right? It was in the word of God. Do it. And by the way, Nike is a Greek word, which means victory. So if you want victory, do what God wants you to do. Do it. Now, you say, well, I I would like to do it. That's not enough. I'm going to do it. I am, I am, I am, I am, said Sam. Sam, I am, is Sam. Do it. I will tomorrow. No, do it now. Well, you know... I really know what I need to do, but I'm just not up to it yet, but I'm going to get up to it, and when I get up to it, I'll do it. Just do it. Oh, you know, I, no, I need to be more spiritually mature. Do it. Oh, I need, I need help. Do it. Oh, I, it's, it's a big deal. Do it. I don't know if I can. Do it. Do it. Whatever he says to do, those are some big water pots to move. Do it. I don't know if you've ever moved 30 gallons of water in a tank. That's not an easy task, is it? Some of you have trouble with one gallon. It's not an easy task to move 30, 180 gallons of water. That's a lot of weight involved in big clay pots. It's hard, Jesus. I want to do it. I really do want to do it. I can't. Do it. Quit whining, quit complaining. If God said do it, guess what? You can do it. But it's big. You can do it. I don't understand it. You can do it. It's out of my reach. You can do it. Whatever it is, this is so important. I cannot say it enough. Whatever it is, it must be done. All right? Now, that's what Mary says. 
Now let's see what the servants do because there's three features about how they respond to this whole thing that are important for us to learn to respond. And the first thing is they obeyed immediately. There it is. Verse 7. They obeyed immediately. Pretty clear. They went and got those six water pots and they filled them up. What's holding you up? I mean, seriously. If we could just take the time, and like that little mental exercise I mentioned a while ago, just kind of confine myself in the moment, say, what is it you want me? What, what is that whatsoever? And he speaks it to me, then what's my response? My response now is to do it immediately. Don't put it off. Now's the time. It's like the man who'd been lying at the well for 30 some odd years, and we'll talk about that miracle, but when Jesus came to him and told him to get up, there, he, he, you know, uh, he started making a few excuses. I don't have anybody to help me. But when he got up, what happened? When he got up, the miracle happened. So they're getting the pots. What if they don't get the pots? Then there's no miracle. There's, no, there's nothing that's manifest here. But they obeyed immediately. And this is where so many people just lose the connection. They, they somehow just, there's, there's that power failure in their life because they won't put the so-called, you know, socket into the plug. The action of saying, I'm going to plug into what God has said. I'll do it. And then at that point where they, the application, the connection comes, then comes this, this grace of God. But first of all, you do it. But not just partially. You know, there's this, this is obedience that should be a complete obedience. Hit that next one for me because I've probably hit the wrong button. There's, there's the idea that they obeyed completely. It says they filled the water pots to the brim. All right? And that's important. I, I don't believe anything is just coincidental in Scripture, by the way. They filled it to the brim. What's that mean? Well, in common, good old English language, they filled them. <laughs> because if they're not filled to the brim, are they really filled? No, they're not, are they? There's a little more space. They're not filled. They're not full. You know, it's kind of like, how many of y'all buy, you know, breakfast cereal occasionally? You open that box of cereal and it's only half full? Buy a bag of potato chips, it's all there, isn't it? You get in there and it's half a bag of chips. You know, somebody's messed up here. <laughs> Contents may have settled during shipping. That doesn't fly in your spiritual life. <laughs> you can't tell the Lord the contents settled during shipping, Okay. You do completely what the Lord wants you to do and stand back and get ready and see what he does because it says they filled them to the brim. Anything less than that's not complete obedience. Everything up to that means more blessing, more grace of God. And I love that story in the Old Testament where there's this drought going on and Elisha sends the woman who has no water to go get her water pots. And she said, I don't have any water pots. She says, go borrow water pots. And she borrows all these water pots, and they're all filled up. Nobody has water. She's got an abundance of water. Everybody had lots of water pots to loan her. They probably thought she was out of her mind. There's a drought. There's no water, man. Yeah, take my pot. <laughs> Roll their eyes at her. She walks out. And she gets all these pots, and the Lord filled them all up. We just don't make room with our obedience many times. And God's not doing great things in our life because he doesn't have the great area of our life to do it in. We've pushed him off the platform. We've pushed him out of the driver's seat. We've pushed him out of the way. And therefore, we're not seeing this, this obedience in our life that is immediate and complete. But not only that, it should be successive because this is just what they did. It just wasn't one instruction. It was a multiple instruction. He said, I want you to take this and, and I want you to fill the jugs, all right, and then draw out the water out of the jugs and bear it to the chief waiter, to the head guy. So there's this successive instruction that they're receiving in their life. And with that successive instruction comes the great grace of God and the miracle of transformation from water to wine. Most people don't see a continual work of God in their life because somewhere they stop in the process. They give up. They just quit. They don't continue walking with God in their life. Oh, it was good last year, but where is God now? I love the scripture when it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Isn't that a good word? In other words, if I want direction in my life, the Word of God's going to provide that in my life. I just believe a lot of people aren't interested in direction because they don't get in the Word. If you're a person who says, well, I love the Word, but you never read it, you don't love the Word. You love to tell people you love the Word, and you love to think you love the Word, but you don't really love the Word. You'll be in the Word if you love the Word. I love my wife. How do I know that? I'm not out loving somebody else's wife. Make sense? Chasing after other women. Why? Because I really do love my wife. Now, if I just say I love my wife, I'm not looking at other women, chasing other women, I don't really love my wife, do I? Nope. 
All right, so what if I say I love the Word, but I'm never in the Word? Do I really love the Word? Oh, that was a pitiful response. <laughs> Do I really love the Word? No! But I want direction for my life. Hey, you can't get enough the Word on Sunday morning to supply what you really need for the week, all right? This is just the Word that comes out. But hey, there has to be a commitment to the Word of God in your life because that's where the light is going to come from. The Bible says it's a lamp to my feet. It doesn't say it is a lighthouse to my feet. Lighthouse casts that long beam you can see out across the coastline and out into the waters, directing those ships in the dark where the, where the shoreline is. It's not like that. All right? Now, we get a long look at things in the, in the general flow of the will of God. We know the days are evil. We know the signs of the time. We know that Jesus Christ is coming. We know there's going to be a great wedding feast for the saints of God. Amen. We know there's going to be a great judgment in the end of days. So we get that kind of look. But as far as the particulars of my own life, it's a step at a time. What's the old statement? The, the, the journey of, of, of the longest journey begins with a single step. It's the same in your spiritual life. One guy said, I just want to be a man of God. How do I get there? Start walking. It's day by day. And if you live a day-by-day -day life for Jesus Christ, at one point you'll be able to look at the end of your life and you'll see that you've walked a godly walk and lived a godly life. But is this obedience in your life comes to this point where it's willing to be successive in your life, where you say, well, I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. That's when you're allowing the Word to be the lamp. It shows you basically a step or two at a time. Am I, am I taking that step? And if I do that, guess what? The light keeps moving with me. If we walk in the light, First John says, as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. Right? And he goes on to say, and the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. Because if I'm walking in the light, I'm still going to see where I've been walking wrong. I'm going to have to confess my sin. But what happens here? This successive obedience of, of being obedient to the Lord and walking with him, that's where you're going to see the transformation take place. That's where the glory is going to happen. But there's three last things here, and I got this from a guy named J. Sidlow Baxter. If you, if you ever want to just get a, a, any really good reading material, this is a, a theologian from the, from the last century and uh, just loved God. He was an Englishman. I got, had the opportunity to hear him preach a couple times. But Baxter put these three points in a little daily devotional book that I have. I caught these three points out of it one time. And it says, you know, when you look at this miracle, the main features of the outcome in response to the obedience of the servants was this. One, there was a supernatural intervention. Why? The water was turned into wine. There's a supernatural intervention. God did something. How many of you need God to do something? How many need God to show himself mighty in your life? How many of you know God is there, but he's not really showing up where you are, it seems to be, and what God's doing in your life? The water, by the way, was really turned into wine. This is not a myth. There, there's another theologian by the name Barclay out there. He's got a book on the miracles of Jesus, and he goes through it. He just kind of debunks all the miracles, you know. That those, you know, like those thousands of Egyptians that were following Moses through the Red Sea, that Moses and them really went off by, it was called the Reed Sea, because there was lots of reeds, and those several million Jews went walked across and just a few inches of water on the reeds. So he was explaining the miracle. I wanted to write him, but he'd already passed away and say, if they went across in about three inches of water on the reeds, how did all those Egyptians drown in three inches of water that were following them? <laughs> because they were all swallowed up. Hey, this really happened. There really was a supernatural intervention. But the greatest of all these supernatural inventions, interventions is not water turning into wine. It's a sinner being saved by the grace of God. Someone who's lost and judged and under condemnation and bound for an eternity in hell can be saved by the grace of God, changed by the grace of God, made fit for heaven. That is worth praising the Lord for. That is a miracle. The greatest miracle of all is this transformation of a man's life, his soul made new in Christ, made acceptable in God's presence. That's the glory of God. That's the real wine of life. That's the joy, that God takes that which is natural and perhaps might have some kind of life and substance to it, but makes it full of life. Because in the New Testament, this wine always represents joy and the Spirit-filled life and the overcoming powerful life that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this supernatural image, and God's still intervening. Not only is it a supernatural, it's a social transformation. In other words, there's a problem, and now the problem becomes a blessing. There's a blessing that happens here. An issue is taken care of. We have issues and problems and crises and difficulties in our lives all the time. I mean, when it seems like we just get over one, we're headed for another. Anybody ever feel that way? 
But how do we walk in that way? Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. There's going to be troubles. How many of you are going through some trouble right now? There's some issues and some difficulties and some hardships you're, you may be facing financially, you know, in your little world of economy or in your family or on your job. Hey, this is, this is where God comes and masters the troubled sea supernaturally. And he steps onto the scene and he gives you grace and strength and wisdom, and he takes the problem and turns it into grace and peace and joy. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives peace. I give you a peace that passes all understanding. So there's this supernatural intervention of God. There's this transformation that takes place in the whole of the situation. The third thing is here, you know, is the significant revelation. Here's what happens, because this is what it was really all about. It says, this is the beginning of miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee that manifested forth his glory, and many of his disciples believed on him. Some guys were just following to see what was going to happen. This was the point of contact for them. This was the point of faith for them. When they began to see that Jesus really is the Messiah, that he is the Christ. Everybody had been talking about it. Not everybody's necessarily committing to it, but now these commitments take place. Listen, one of the great things in your life will be when you really give your heart to Jesus Christ. And it's not religion, and it's not something your mama did for you, or something your daddy or your grandmother talked about, but in your own personal life, you make a commitment to believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Has that ever happened? Because if that hadn't happened, you're just going to miss everything God has for your life. And there's a lot of people filling churches they, who've never experienced this water into wine of their life, where that God took these clay pots... They were just ordinary clay pots and does something unique in them and transforms them within like this water into wine. This life of deadness is now really fullness. Where there was no grace, there is grace. Where there's only judgment, there's peace and victory and the power of God and the presence. There's a lot of people who have information. I mean, my mother, uh, if you were to ask her to share her testimony, when she got saved as a young lady, she would tell you, Someone asked me if I was a Christian. I always said yes. I was in church every Sunday. I was an American and a patriot. I believed in God and country. But I wasn't saved. Because genuine salvation comes when there's this point of surrender to God. That's when the waters turn to wine in your life. But there's a lot of people like that. You know, they, they're in church and they're good people, and they're moral people. They've been raised by godly parents, perhaps, but they've never made a genuine personal commitment of their own heart and their life. Jesus said, if you do not believe and repent, then you perish. And that's not something my mama can do for me, or my grandmother, my parents. You know, I, I can't be a Christian just because I'm born in a Christian family. Any more than you can park in your garage the next three months, and you're going to wake up a Chevrolet one morning. It's not going to happen, is it? The old saying goes, you can sit in a fruit bowl all you want to, but it's not going to make you a banana. It doesn't happen that way. God gets on the scene and a transformation takes place by the grace of God. When you surrender your heart and your life, say, I can't do this on my own. I am a sinner. Please forgive me. And you receive him and you trust him now for what you can't do. You cannot save yourself over and over and over again, the Bible makes it clear, if you trust in yourself and what you can do for God to save you, it's waste of time. Not of works, lest anybody should boast. Because that only brings, by the way, if you can do it yourself, boasting and arrogance and pride. God wants to do something in every one of our hearts and every one of our lives, but it all comes back to this key verse where it says, whatever he says unto you, that's what you do. What is it? For some of you today, it might mean, hey, it's time to get rid of this pretend pseudo-Christianity that I've been going through and thinking is sufficient because in my heart of hearts, I know it's not. Jesus said it this way, you must be born again. And to take that step and take that commitment today, say, to say it's not good enough to be good enough. I need Christ. I need Jesus in my life. Well, I read the Bible, I pray. Listen, lost people do that all the time. You know? Muslims read the book of Quran, they pray. Hindus, they, they pray. You know? Prayer is not the issue here. It's relationships the issue. And not any relationship, it's the relationship with Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. We stand before God one day to receive judgment. And only if we're under the blood of Jesus, the Bible says, he that believeth in own Christ, the life is committed him, shall not come under judgment. No condemnation for those that are saved. If that's not you, that do it phrase today applies to you getting your heart right with God. Give your life to Jesus today.
for you that are Christians, there's some area you've been walking on. And I believe God is so powerful and so sovereign that even in this moment, while I have been sharing these words and speaking this message to you, that the Holy Spirit of God has shown you what the it is and do it. He's shown you what it is. He spoke to you clearly. That's what you need to do. Don't put that off. That's why we give invitations at Believer's Fellowship. A lot of churches don't even give invitations anymore. But I believe when Jesus spoke, he always gave that opportunity for people to respond. Come, follow me, he said. You see it throughout the scriptures. The, the Bible opens up with God looking for Adam and saying, Adam, where are you? He's calling him to himself. It closes in the book of Revelation. The spirit and the bride say, come. Respond to what God's saying to you. Come to the word of God. Get in the light. Do whatever it is. Do it completely, whatever it is. Do it exclusively, whatever it is. In honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, I believe as we look at these miracles,